This ad-free podcast is part of your Slate Plus membership. Hello, and welcome to the Slate Political Gab Fest. March 31st, 2023, Gab Fest special, Trump is indicted edition. I'm David Plotz of CityCast. I'm here in Washington, D.C. I'm, as ever, joined by Emily Bazelon of the New York Times Magazine and Yale University Law School from New Haven. Hello, Emily. Hey, David. Or New Haven slash some TV studio where she probably has spent the last 16 hours. Also, someone who has spent the last 16 hours in TV studio, John Dickerson of CBS Primetime. Hello, John. Good morning, David. Hello, Emily. Hey. Today on the Gab Fest, President Trump becomes the first ex-president or president ever criminally indicted. What is the case against him? What effect will it have on American politics and potentially on the 2024 election? So a grand jury in New York working uh, at the behest of Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg has indicted former President Donald Trump, presumably for charges related to the payoff of Stormy Daniels. The indictment is still sealed. Trump will likely be arraigned in Manhattan next week. Will there be handcuffs? Will there be a prison cell? Will there be bail? We will find out. Then there is potentially going to be a trial at some point, perhaps in the midst of the 2024 presidential campaign. And perhaps in the morass, in the stew, in the kind of miasma, in the, the asteroid belt of up to three other criminal indictments of Trump relating to the Georgia election manipulation that he attempted to do, the absconding with and hiding top secret documents that he may have done and the attempt to overturn the election on January 6th. There are all these multiple investigations happening. So Emily, as far as we know, what is Trump likely to be indicted for in New York and what's the legal theory behind the indictments and what, what is he facing if he is found guilty? I mean, as far as we know, this is about the hush money payments, like you said. And there's a misdemeanor that has to do with falsifying business records, because when Trump signed these checks to pay back Michael Cohen for paying off Stormy Daniels, the checks were recorded as being for legal services, which this wasn't. And then the question is whether the district attorney can succeed in his theory that this is a felony because the falsifying of the business records was in order to commit another crime, and then the other crime would involve influencing the 2020 election in a way that violates New York's election laws. It's the putting together of the two charges that hasn't been tried before in New York. And so you're going to hear the phrase novel legal theory 8 million times if you haven't already. And that's why. Do we know that that's his case and that that's even his theory? No, we don't know anything because we haven't seen the indictment. I'm just going off of what we think is happening and I think some reporters are pretty sure that the case is about the hush money, but I mean, it could be another theory. There could be additional counts to the indictment, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it could be something else entirely. It's just this is all we've got. Right. It could be one of three things. It could be a misdemeanor and he doesn't do the novel legal thing. That would be stupid, but it could be that. It could be the novel thing you just described, or it could be that plus what Cy Vance was, his predecessor was investigating beforehand, which is malfeasance by the Trump organization and or an animal to be named later. I mean, I think the reporting suggests it's a felony and that it's not those other tax violation stuff. But until we see the indictment, you're right. We're not going to know for sure. It, and actually, Emily, can you just catch us up on the other cases? Because this is this is one. This is one. But I think there is widespread thought that there it's highly possible that Trump could face a criminal charge in these other cases and what what those are briefly. Yeah, there's the prosecutor in Fulton County, Georgia, who's considering whether to charge Trump for, you know, the hunt for votes in Georgia in the election where Trump called up the secretary of state, Brad Raffensperger, and said, can you find me the votes I need to win? Then there is the question of whether the Justice Department will charge him either relating to all the classified documents that were squirreled away in Mar-a-Lago and or something involving the January 6th um, insurrection and the idea that he broke the law in some way by um, fomenting rebellion 
I mean, that's not a technical term, but right, that like it's his fault that people <laughs> stormed Congress and tried to prevent them from certifying the election. Right. Yeah, but interfering with an official proceeding might be might be the better way to put it. Yes. Right. Exactly. But it, but 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 like with the Manhattan DA, we don't know, as you suggest, we it could be any number of other things and Mar-a-Lago the same, both. It could be there could be an obstruction charge, which is what you you were talking about last week in the the crime exception. What's the term of art again, Emily? Uh, crime fraud exception to the attorney client privilege. Yes. Right. So there could be um, not only that he had the documents, but then he asked his lawyer to engage in a fraud to or a cover up to hide them. And then there's also the national security implications of whatever he may have had, which has been a bit of a sleeper. It's not a um, it's not a, ch- a criminal charge, I don't think. But, um, you know, at some point, the national security uh, apparatus is going to weigh in with whatever former President Trump had with him at Mar-a-Lago and say, hey, this was either really dangerous or not, which has its own effects. John, I, I know temperamentally how reluctant you are to weigh in on things where we don't we just don't even know what is in this indictment. And so and yet here you are with us, the reckless. Yeah, you can. But you can call You can you can say pass um, uh, and we'll move on to the next clue. But what's your take on the the politics of this case coming first and how that's likely to affect Republican politics in particular and 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 Republican public sentiment? Thanks for the estimation. Um, um, I think there are two things that I feel comfortable weighing in on. I've already weighed in pedantically on the fact that we don't actually know what's in the indictment. And Trump doesn't know what's in the indictment. Um, And I'd love to get Emily's take on the commerce between the DA's office and Trump's lawyers in terms of telling him what's in the indictment, whether that and how you kind of arrange to get him. But before we get to that, it seems there are two things you can weigh in on. One is your question, which is if, if I play the role for a moment of Republican strategists, I want this to come up first of all of them, because at the moment, what we have is the political analysts on TV and the Republicans framing of what this case is. So we are, if I'm a Republican strategist, in the sweet spot moment. We don't have the facts of the case. So I can say that this is a politically motivated persecution. I can say it's interfering with the next election, which is what Kevin McCarthy said. And I don't have to wrestle with the facts, which might be quite damning. And that it would be harder to wrestle if there's a huge, long uh, indictment with lots of facts and all kinds of other messy things that get in the way. So for the moment, you want to you want to set the the storyline right now and set it not just for what the Manhattan DA is doing, but make it all a part of the same piece, which is persecution of a political person. And by the way, that helps you not just with framing this challenge to your party, the challenge to your party being that its leader, that its leader is, you know, probably going to find himself um, in very bad legal shape. I don't mean in the DA case, I mean, in the special counsel case. Um, but you also are appealing to the base of the party, which is supporting that president. And you want to show that you're a team player, which has is for your long term future. And that's what the Republicans are doing. So in that sense, it's a it's a great gift to them that this is coming up first from a political standpoint. The other point I'd like to make quickly is in this we are this is an this is an explosive thing happening at a volatile moment in American politics. We saw what happened when Donald Trump didn't agree with an official proceeding. It led to the riots on January 6th. If you are on his team, you have a choice. You can add fuel to the fire or take fuel away from the fire. And you have a really recent example of what happens when you add fuel to the fire and you tell people they're being cheated. And you tell people, as the Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, did that Alvin Bragg is trying to interfere with the next election. You know what spreading gasoline in this kind of moment does. You've seen it. You have actual feedback from two years ago. And so, too, in the face of that, and remember, Kevin McCarthy said the election was stolen last time. He was a part of the lie until the riot happened. And then he was momentarily upset by that because he was in the Capitol when the riot happened. But there's no question he contributed to the lie gaining power when you have somebody as powerful as the Republican leader in the House. And yet the biofeedback of having lied and then seen the result of that lie has not stuck with him sufficient that in this case, instead of saying, we'll wait to see what the facts are, he's saying that Alvin Bragg is operating to interfere with the next election. That is adding fuel to the fire. And that's something that in this volatile moment, you know, can lead to a volatile result. Yeah. I mean, I found it very disturbing, actually, that one particular uh, instance of this, which was Ron DeSantis saying he would not cooperate with an extradition, which is... 
I mean, thank God. I, I think I think there is very little chance that Trump would go along with that. That Trump would sort of hidey hole in Florida and and attempt to avoid avoid being extradited to New York and like and deal with it that way. But the idea that that DeSantis might even go through with something like that is is shocking. And it would be f- absolutely fascinating scenario. But it would be it would be disastrous for the country if something like that happened. And Emily, check me if I'm wrong, but he actually has no role to play in an extradition. It's all dealt with by the courts, right? The governor can't, he doesn't have a role to play. So so it's totally performative. I mean, I think this is, the problem with this is that what DeSantis is doing is performative. It's politics, but now we're in the realm of criminal law and those are supposed to be separate. And I mean, I share your dim view of mixing them up. I want to tell you about another podcast that I think you should be listening to. We are living through a wild moment in American history. Conspiracy theorists on House committees, extremists on the Supreme Court, near fistfights on C-SPAN. But history is not finished, and we can change its course for the better by staying informed and taking action, big or small. Crooked Media's Pod Save America is hosted by four former Obama aides, John Favreau, John Lovett, Dan Pfeiffer, and Tommy Veter. They worked in government and now use their expertise to provide listeners with a no-bullshit guide to democracy. Every week, they break down all the political news that makes us laugh, cry, and scream into the void to help us figure out what matters and what each of us can do about it. They take you behind the scenes as they talk to politicians, activists, artists, and journalists, and they have a lot of fun while they're doing it. Pod Save America is news with action items. They give you the tools you need so you can do your part and stay in the fight. Find Pod Save America wherever you get your podcasts. Our nation has a love-hate relationship with argument. A lot of us love to argue, but even more of us hate the result. Our politics seem stuck in the mud, and many of our self-appointed thought leaders are reducing the great debates of our time to shouting matches. And it's not just in politics. It's art. It's culture. Thoughtful discussion is missing almost everywhere in our lives. But you'll find it on Hear Me Out, Slate's new podcast, I'm your host, Celeste Headley. Each week, we'll bring you an insightful guest with a challenging point of view and engage them in an honest, good-faith dialogue without partisan cliches. It's human life. If it's that important to you, you have to put your money where your mouth is. Often, the police don't do anything to resolve the questions that you call them for, and yet we are taught that the police are the only people we can call. Everything that Ben Shapiro is going to say is not necessarily good, but the best way to prove that a bad idea is bad is not by refusing to talk about it. We'll talk, we'll listen, and we'll ask the hard questions that bring out the best answers from all sides on issues that matter to the world and to you. That's every Tuesday on Slate's Hear Me Out with me, Celeste Headley. Starting on March 21st, join us wherever you listen. Speaking of performative, Emily, let's switch to what will be a performance next week. If Trump is arraigned, he will likely have to go to Manhattan. He will you know, have to appear before a, a judge. There will be, maybe he'll be have to pay some bail. Uh, maybe he'll be handcuffed. Um, he'll have to sit somewhere, perhaps, which he was uncomfortable for some period of time as he awaits for things. Maybe. Or maybe they'll, and I think this would be perfectly reasonable that because this is an ex-president, because there is still the dignity of the office, you you just don't want to compound it. Uh, you don't want to compound the embarrassment. I think it would be perfectly reasonable for them to to give him some special treatment. But what is likely to happen? I mean, there already is special treatment for white collar defendants who have defense lawyers who are interested in making the kinds of arrangements that are in play here. You agree to fly there. You agree to surrender. They don't have to come and get you. Yes, you have to be fingerprinted. There's a mugshot. I don't really see how you get around that. Um, You know, in New York, they do usually handcuff everybody. Sometimes they let white collar defendants who are non accused of nonviolent charges put their hands in front of them instead of behind. Maybe that's a dignity they should afford to to everyone. Maybe we don't really need to handcuff people at arraignment. I'm not really sure, like, what I think about that. He's not going to go to jail because of bail reform in New York. And... It, it is going to be theatrical because he will make it so and because being arrested is humiliating. And so that you got to take your lumps on that. Yes, it is, of course, humiliating to be arrested. But there is a way in which one of Donald Trump's 
most successful stances and his professional stance is victimization. One of the very unattractive features of modern life, and Donald Trump is a massive incarnation of this, is the idea that everyone seeks to be victimized all the time and feel wronged. And it does seem like this will be a good chance for him to to perform victimization because, in fact, here he is being charged with a crime. Yeah. And I think the reason, or I should ask John this, I suppose, but when John was saying that, you know, if you're scripting this for a public and strategist for Trump's campaign, you would want this charge to go first is because it plays so well into victimization and into his grievances, because it's about hush money. It's about paying someone who you were supposedly had sex with. Like, it's easy to see this as beneath everyone's dignity. You know, you can question whether the charges should be brought at all. I'm going to make the case for the charges for a minute. I'm not sure whether I really believe this, but if you're Alvin Bragg, you're sitting there with Trump's names on these checks. His lawyer, Michael Cohen, has already um, been convicted of crimes related to this and is like jumping up and down to testify against the guy. So you have a situation in which the agent... Cohen has been prosecuted successfully and the principal has so far skated. And you say, like, wait a minute, we got to charge the principal, too. I have these New York statutes he's violated. This is sitting here in front of me. I got to do this for the sake of the rule of law and for fairness. And because that's what prosecutors do. They indict people when they have the evidence. There are lots of arguments on the other side, you know, prosecutorial discretion arguments. The Justice Department, which charged Michael Cohen, has not brought these charges against Trump, and it could do so now because Trump's no longer the president. On the other hand, Bragg's charges are state law as opposed to federal law charges. So that weighs in favor of the New York district attorney doing this instead of the feds, I suppose. I don't know. I really think, like, you can argue it both ways. One point that Ricky Kleeman made this morning that I thought was smart about what Merrick Garland is doing with respect to your point that the feds didn't charge on this is that in the prosecutorial discretion, there's also how many fish you got to fry. And Merrick Garland's got the special counsel cases, both Trump and Biden um, on the documents part, and then the, the undermining of the entire election case, which also includes, of course, those, you know, hundreds of participants in the riot on January 6th. So his stack of work is quite big and different than Bragg's also, although obviously Bragg's got a lot of things to deal with with Manhattan. But on the presidential docket front, Garland's got this whole other stack of work. How do you both feel about the precedent setting aspect of this, right? So this is the first time we're going to hear that 8 million times we already have. There has been a high bar, right, for prosecuting presidents. I mean, Bill Clinton lied under oath about his affair with Monica Lewinsky. He was allowed to admit that he lied. He didn't get prosecuted. He had his law license taken away. Ford obviously pardoned um, Richard Nixon. (sighs) We're changing that rule. Is this a kind of ticky-tack way to do that? And will that open up? further prosecutions that are more, you know, retributive, that are more partisan, that like truly do feel like witch hunts. I have so many thoughts on this. One thought, this goes to a conversation we had yesterday, which is that one of the traits of the American political system is that it has this, it weakens centralized power by placing all kinds of other uh, levels of power in the country. And one of those is state prosecutor, prosecutorial power. And so One thing that's really interesting about this case is that it is a state case, not a federal case. There may be federal cases against Trump. That is clearly a very important, it's very important for New York State to be able to charge violations of New York State law. But given the politicization of this country, I think it is it is a is an absolute certainty. I guarantee it as a matter of of predictable fact that in the next 10 years, there will be a Republican prosecutors who are bringing criminal charges against Democratic politicians. Um, that are like motivated, that are motivated by politics, and that that use cite this as precedent, and that are that are real stretches. That po- that that prosecution for political purposes will become more of a tool in the arms of state prosecutors. And I think that it's much like, less likely to happen at the federal level because I just think it's there's a lot more tension. It's harder to pull it off. But but I definitely think it's going to happen. That's not to say that. Trump hasn't committed a crime. It is just to say that yes, it will be used presidentially and and in skeezy ways in the future. That's number one. Number two, I actually, I'm really kind of, it's not that I'm troubled by the charges against Trump, 
But I kind of feel like what was he supposed to do? Like when you pay off somebody, when you're paying somebody off, he how could he have put it on the business? How could he have said like this is a payoff to prevent a sex scandal coming out? Like well, pay it out of his you hide it in the business. That? Well, but David, pay- come on, like if you're paying off someone in a sex scandal because you want to hide it to influence an election, then yeah, you have to keep it a secret. And that's the problem. I and mean, do you think he didn't do this to influence the election? And isn't that the key question? I think it's really hard to to know. Like it, it, it he, he may have done it to influence the election. He may have done it because it's embarrassing. And he was like, really this, this makes trouble go away. This it makes something made- goes away. I guess so. I mean, it might have made his wife angry, I suppose, maybe. I think it was I think there's evidence that it was done with respect to the election, the catch and kill um, system that was in place using the National Enquirer to take. So there's that. But then I think secondarily, you don't have to put it on your Trump organization expenses. You can pay for it yourself. As I understand, the private checking accounts are perfectly usable, (laughs) according to what the Citibank (laughs) manual says, for the paying of hush money. I believe there's no you can fair now point. Venmo. It's a fair point. It's a fair point. But yeah. if I you're mean, gonna, I guess if you're gonna pay it out of your personal account, it's just like. It, but I mean, I this do, goes back to the point that he used his bi- he used his David. he used his <laughs> business as a piggy bank already. But I do think that if you are Alvin Bragg, I uh, just piggybacking on what you're saying, David, and your um, your uh, queasiness, if that's a way to characterize what you're feeling about this. I mean. This is a super uh, risky thing to do, and he better have not only the goods, but um, kind of more than just relying on no one is above the law. I mean, because it happens in a context, and um, and he is taking on this is a national and histo- and historic moment, and so um, that I uh, I what you would hope went into his calculation, and it will be. You know, the reason this is a beneficial chain of events for Republicans seeking to defend Donald Trump, um, because they have no choice but to defend him, given the shape and the structure of the party, is that they've got now, uh, you know, Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and much of Tuesday to keep saying this is political. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, railroading somebody to interfere with the next election without having to deal with the facts. And Bragg, you know, you could, uh, you've got to wonder about that, which he's letting his case be defined for six days. Um, and then, you know, he, the facts better be pretty powerful when they come out to bash back that six days of definition. And we know from the way the brain works that the first thing you hear tends to take root. And so there are going to be a lot of people who think like, oh, this is a BS case about like, why, what, why? So wait, so he had an affair. What's why get prosecuted over that? Which is if you went back to to the 1990s and you said to Republicans, "Hey, start sharpening or pay a lot of attention to all the defenses of Bill Clinton because every defense that the Democrats are making of Bill Clinton, you're going to have to roll those out in a few years." They would have thought you were speaking deep calumnies. I, you're so right about that lag in timing, John. I'm not sure why Bragg is letting it roll out that way. It does seem like it could cause him a lot of problems in the court of public opinion. I mean, unless he's setting the hook. So, you know, one of the things you do when asking questions is ask, like, is put yourself out there to get walloped, to bait a person into walloping you. And then you go, oh, but here I have you on tape doing the thing you just said you didn't do. So it depends on the strength of the of the evidence that you provide to pull off that sort of now I'm going to mix my metaphor that um, or to, you know, to play jujitsu, to use the strength of the reaction in the six days um, to actually uh, put a finer point on the actual evidence you have. But that better be the play he's running if he wants to succeed in the court of public opinion. Are either of you intrigued by the fact that Alan Weisselberg, who was the head of the Trump organization, who was convicted of fraud or pled guilty? He pled. He pled. Pled. Uh, fired his lawyers and is like sort of looking like maybe, I mean, this is total speculation, but, you know, could he be flipped? Is that a sort of secret card that Bragg is holding? I'm really speculating here to be clear, but I, it's it's sort of intriguing while we're in speculation land, isn't it? Well, your, your speculation is informed by the fact that Weisselberg w- pled in a case um Related to what the DA was investigating. I mean, yes. so it's like, yeah, he's a he's known to the he's known to the grand jury, as they say. Yeah, I mean, although he's been very loyal, he has gone out of his way to protect Trump. So that would be a, a real shift. 
Emily, when there is the arraignment and the actual indictment is unsealed and Trump gets to see it for the first time and, and the public does, is there a page you'll rush to to seek um, the answer to a burning question you have about this indictment? I will rush to obviously find out what the counts are and also to see if we can tell what witnesses other than Michael Cohen, the district attorney, has lined up. I mean, Cohen is so out there in public. We know exactly what he's going to say. What else does Bragg have? That is our Gap Fest special for today. The Gap Fest is produced by Shana Roth. Our researcher is Julie Hugan. Our theme music is by They Might Be Giants, Ben Richmond, and Senior Director for Podcast Operations, Alicia Montgomery, VP of Audio for Slate. Please follow us on Twitter at, at SlateGabFest and tweet your chatter to us there or email your chatter to us at gabfest at slate.com. For Emily Bazelon and John Dickerson, I'm David Plotz. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next week, which is what I said yesterday. And then we talked to you today. So maybe we'll talk to you before next week. Who knows? Bye-bye.